Good afternoon. Let's worship all.
our source of joy. He's our source of hope. He's our grace and he's our peace. And if you've never experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ, today it could be your day. At age 12, Jesus came into my heart and he's not asking me, my Lord, to save me, rescue me. It hasn't been perfect, but I strive each and every day to serve him as best as I can. So if you can relate to these words, would you sing them along with me today? For I spoke a word singing over you have been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathe your life in me you have been so so Tear down 
coming after me. Come on, let's tell him today. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. chase after us for those that are seeking hope, peace, joy answers today God I pray that you would meet them meet us right where we are today we thank you for the opportunity that we have to sing to you to lift these words up as a song of praise as a song of adoration and proclamation. Believing, God, that you're moving in this room. Thank you today. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yes, seven of you. That's great. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yes, I am too. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited about what God is doing here at Grace. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace. And, and I, if you're new to Grace, I just want to say welcome. All right. We were hoping you, were come, you would come. We've been waiting for you. All right. And we'd love to help you get connected to the Grace family. There's a very easy way to do this. And actually, I, for, for this, I want us all to pull out our phones real quick. Go ahead. Tag out your phones. Make sure the ringer's off. I'm telling you, it happens more than you know. All right. Make sure the ringer's off and, and, and then as you have while you have your phone off if you'll out if you'll just scan the qr code on the on the 
back of the chair in front of you. Scan that QR code on there. There's a list of so many things that are going on here at Grace. But if you're new here, there's a button that says, I'm new here. And it's the easiest way to get connected, to start the conversation, to ask questions. Uh, we'd love to answer any questions that you have and just get information to you on, on how you can get connected here at Grace. Now, some of the things that you'll see on there is we have information about Easter, and you saw this in your seat as you came in. These are our invite cards, all right? They're not save the dates for you, all right? They're actually for you to take and, and invite someone to come to Easter with you at Grace. If you're on the back, you'll see that there are six services, three on Saturday, three on Sunday. There's so many choices. The easiest way to do this is to go to the, your neighbor, co-worker, the, the, the parent of somebody on, on the basketball team, baseball team, soccer team softball team, whatever, all right? Go to them and say, hey, we'd love for you to be with us at Grace. There's so many service, services. Which one could you go to? I'll meet you there. Come and sit with me at Grace. You'd be surprised how many people will be willing to take you up on that. Invite them to come be a part of it. Also on there, you'll see that we'll have three Easter egg, egg hunts, uh, two on Saturday, one on Sunday. So if they have little ones. We have a great time uh, with those kiddos at that. Now, as a part of that, if you're a part of the Grace family, here's what you need to know. is that it, We don't want to just attend church. We want to be the church, which means that we want to be ready for those that God is bringing to experience His grace for the first time. And so we want to welcome them in. So listen, if you've never served at Grace before, maybe you served and you've taken a step back. This is a great next step for you. To, to attend one and to serve five. I'm just kidding. Attend one and serve one, all right? We need everyone to step up and serve, all right? And, and be a part of what God is doing here at Grace to welcome those that God is bringing. And, and our prayer is that they will experience God's grace for themselves. You can sign up to, to serve on Easter. It, it, once again, it's a great, easy first serve. Sign up to serve at Easter through the QR code or stop by the hub. We can help you with that. Hey, if you are a part of Grace, you've been a part of Grace for a little while, maybe uh, you've just started coming and you see the Uncharted shirts. Uh, if you've been a part of Grace since last fall, you know we did the Uncharted Initiative. All right, We had a series about Uncharted that God is leading us into uncharted territory as he's bringing more and more people to hear the truth of his grace. We exist as a church to, in, to inspire and equip people to know and follow Jesus. And we want to continue to do that. We want to continue to reach those that God has placed us here to reach. And so we're on this uncharted initiative where we're trying to make more room for those who are just now coming. And, and you are part of this service. I'm so grateful. Our other two services were packed. So thank you for helping us make room. But we're going to continue to find ways to make room for those who are just now coming. Uh, our kids' areas are packed. And so we're making more room through this uncharted initiative. Uh, now, some of you uh, who you've been a part of this, you're like, I get this question every week. All right, so when do we break ground? <laughs> well, it's going to be next fall sometime, all right? We're still in the planning and permitting process, all right? Th this is a long process if you've ever been a part of a building thing. There's all sorts of permits, permits, and actually, if you see drive out the land today, you'll see flags all over the land. They have to come and mark everything that's ever been put under the dirt here, okay? And it's all marked, and, and you see little pieces of progress along the way. But I want you to know, as we have things happen, we will let you know. But here's what you can do in the process. Be praying. Listen, the permitting and the planning process, it, it, there's a lot of things that can be barriers. They can be speed bumps. There can be things that slow us down. Pray that it all goes smoothly, that God gives us great favor, and that he does, he, in, in the provision side, that he gives abundantly more than what we need or even imagine so that we can continue to carry out God's mission as a church here at Grace. If you've not been a part of the Uncharted Initiative, you can find out more about what we're doing and, and what's actually going to happen at gf.church slash uncharted. Actually, there's also a button at the QR code. All right, so everything's there. So you can click on that and find out more about what we're doing and how to do it and how you can be a part of it. Today, if you want to give back to God um, to, to help us with our mission, to, 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 but also in obedience to him, just giving back to him what he's asked of us to give to him as, as a way of honoring him, as a way of recognizing that everything that we have comes from him. Today, if you'd like to give back to God with us as we worship him in that way, you can give through the giving boxes or through the QR code. And uh, we'd love for you to join us in that way. Today, we're continuing a series called 
Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. All right. And we are so glad you're here. If you were here last week, you heard about unbelievable joy. If you missed it, go check it out. It was amazing. Today, we're going to talk about unbelievable grace. Uh, here's what I want you to do. It is an amazing message. Get your notes ready. Uh, whether you, you're the old fashioned p- pencil and paper, pen and paper, there's paper in front of you. Take notes or on your phone, or you can follow along on the sermon notes through the QR code as well. But I believe God has a word for you today. I'm so excited about the speaker that we have today. He's not a stranger to many of you, but if if you haven't been a part of Grace for very long, you may not know him yet, but he is our founding pastor, our legacy pastor. He's my father-in-law. He's a mentor and an incredible encourager. And so today I'm excited to, to introduce to you uh, Pastor B.J. Rutledge. Will you welcome him to the stage this morning? It is so good to be with you guys and uh, to be back up here. It's kind of fun to be able to do that. And I just want you to know that Janet and I, my wife and I, are so excited about what we see God doing here at Grace. It's incredible. Uh, We're so thankful for Pastor Chris and the way God is using him to lead our church. And and I also want you to know that we're all in with Uncharted. So I hope you'll be a part of that and, uh, and get involved. I mean, be all in because this is a place that is great to be. Hope you had an unbelievably great spring break. I mean, we had a really good time on our spring break. We spent a couple of days last week and the week before out in West Texas, and uh, I did some stuff with my brother-in-law, who's a rancher and a farmer. Uh, He used to have a lot of cattle, but he had to get rid of the cattle for a variety of reasons, but he still has several hundred sheep, and we went down to the ranch to do some work. I didn't notice any sheep. I thought, what happened? I know he didn't sell them, so I just asked him, I said, yeah, hey, JL, I mean, what happened to the sheep? And he said, well, they're on spring break. And I thought, on spring break? Where do sheep go on spring break? And he said, to the Bahamas. <laughs> That's so bad. Or somebody told me a while ago, That's so bad. All right? And it's not going to get any better. So you're in for a great treat. So we're, we're having a good time. Hey, I am glad you're here, and uh, we did get to spend some time with my brother-in-law, who's one of my good friends. Uh, He became a good friend right after I committed my life to Christ, so we've known each other for a long, long time, And, and it's unbelievable. We did go down there, and I did help him. I was helping him build out some living quarters in a new barn that he had built on uh, part of the property so he could use that. And it's unbelievable how much that we were able to get done just in a few days. And I say that because we're both getting older and we kept forgetting where the tape measure was. I mean, I said, hey, we need to measure this. Get the tape measure. And he said, well, you get it. I said, well, I don't know where it is. He said, well, I don't either. Where'd you leave it? I don't know. I mean, we couldn't remember where the tape measure was. And then when we found it and we made a measurement and we went after the saw to cut it, then we couldn't even remember. Okay, was that 40 and a quarter? Was that 44 and a quarter? <laughs> we just had that issue going on. And, and I guess that's kind of normal. You know, some of you are probably younger and you haven't hit this stage yet, but you'll get there, I promise, where you just can't remember things. And I just read a deal from scientists, and, and the scientists have found there are three distinct stages of old age, or three distinct signs, not stages, signs of old age. One is memory loss, okay? We understand that. The second one is, um, 
Okay, well, I'm glad I'm here anyhow, so we'll, we'll get to that later. But seriously, JL and I spent several days working together. We had some unbelievable conversations. Uh, some of them were really funny as we talked about things in the past and things going on now, and some were very serious about some of the things that we're going through in our families and, uh, you know, what we want to see happen. And you, you never know when you're going to have a serious conversation with somebody, a significant conversation. It could happen with your family or friends. I had one just a couple of weeks ago with my three-year-old grandson, Henry. He's my youngest grandson. Now, there are some days that Janet or I bring him here to Grace because he goes to Grace Kids, which, by the way, is incredible. If you've got kids, it's great for them. And he calls it his school. So when we say, hey, we're going to take you to school, he knows exactly what we're talking about. And, you know, a couple of months ago, I mentioned to Henry, I said, Henry, you know, one of these times we ought to go a little bit earlier. Maybe we can stop, you know, at the donut store and get some donuts. And, you know, that was a great idea. And then a couple of weeks ago, I took him to school. I brought him here. And on the way, we had this incredible conversation. Check it out. Do you see that big truck? Yeah. Yeah. Did you see Jack's school? Um, yes. Okay. Did you see Ben's school? Yes. And now we're going to your school? No. No? Oh, okay. We're going. Hey, Papa B. Yeah. The donut store right there. Oh, you see it? Yeah, I see it. Okay. That was our conversation, right? I'm getting old and I can't remember anything. Henry's three and remembers everything, especially if it relates to the donut store. And by the way, we did stop and get donuts. But hey, um, let me just ask you a question. When is the last time that you had a really significant conversation with someone. I mean, it may have been unbelievably good or maybe it was unbelievably tough, but when was the last time that you had that kind of conversation? I mean, maybe in your family it was something that was really, really good, unbelievably good because you got to come and tell your family that your, your boss is telling you, hey, you're getting that promotion and raise that you'd been hoping to get. Or maybe it's unbelievably tough because you go in to see your boss and he's telling you that they're gonna have to let you go. Maybe it's an unbelievably great conversation that you're having with your kids because one of your kids come home and they made all A's. I mean, it's incredible. You're so excited for them. Or maybe it's unbelievably tough because you've got a child that's out of control and rebellious and you're just kind of at your wit's end. Maybe it's unbelievably good because one of your kids is getting married and you're excited about the person that they're getting married to. Or maybe it's a tough conversation because you're actually talking to a counselor because your marriage is in real trouble. Maybe it's unbelievably good because you're talking to a friend who just got their 10-year coin or their 10-year chip because they've been sober for 10 years and they're so excited to, to talk to you about that. Or maybe it's kind of tough because you're talking to a friend because you're struggling with an addiction. Could be unbelievably good because you get to talk to your family and give them the report that you got from the doctor that you've been cancer-free now for one year, and it is a celebration because you're cancer-free. Maybe it's a tough conversation like we've had in my own family in the past few weeks because some of your loved ones, like a couple of mine, have cancer again. I mean, what's the conversation that comes to your mind when you think about those that were unbelievably tough or maybe unbelievably good? And maybe your most significant conversation hasn't taken place yet, but what I hope is when it comes, and if it comes, that it's unbelievably good. In fact, I, believe, I hope that it's unbelievably good, like a conversation that Jesus had with a man named Nicodemus one night. And in this Nick at Night conversation, Nicodemus had some questions, and Jesus had an unbelievable answer to give to him. Now, Nicodemus was a guy, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't, but he was a guy who people usually went to when they had questions about God. I mean, he was a Pharisee, and in the first century, if you were a Pharisee among the Jewish people, you know what that meant? It meant that you were very religious. In fact, to become a Pharisee, you had to memorize the first five books that we have in our Old Testament. Can you imagine that, trying to memorize all of that, I mean, all of it. And on top of that, he was a part of the Sanhedrin, which is like the religious elite of the whole community. 
And he was a good man. He was a moral man. He was a righteous man. He was a religious man. He prided himself in striving to follow and obey God's law. So people usually came to him with questions about God, but now Nicodemus had questions about God because he had seen and heard Jesus. He had heard about Jesus. Not only that, he had heard Jesus, and he had some tension in him, and so He wanted to have a conversation with Jesus, and so he did so. And one night, under the cover of dark, he went to have this conversation with Jesus, and he went at night because he feared his associates because they hated Jesus. The religious leaders of that day hated Jesus. And Jesus' closest disciple, a man by the name of John who lived with Jesus, walked with him, saw him do all the miracles, was there when he was crucified, when he was buried, and when he was raised from the dead. This eyewitness has written down things that have been preserved for us in the New Testament, and one of those is the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at this story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So if you've got a Bible, you want to turn to John 3, that's great, or you can follow on the sermon notes, or just follow along with me on the screen. We're going to start in John 3, verse 1. Okay, here's what he says. There was a man by the name of Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. We've already talked about that. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God's with you, that God is with you. So, I mean, Nicodemus, he comes and he calls Jesus rabbi, which was a term of respect, which was incredible, and then he compliments him, and he's got some questions because he says, hey, we know that there is evidence that God is with you. In fact, he's with you like we've never seen him be with anybody. I mean, this doesn't make complete sense to us because the things you do aren't normal to us, and, and, and so he does this stuff, and he compliments Jesus, you know, and he, he gives him this title of respect rabbi, and he says some really good stuff about him. We say, we know you're from God, and in that culture, Nicodemus probably expected Jesus to kind of say something nice back to him, like, hey, Nick, I know about you too, right? I know that you're really devoted. I know that you're really devoted uh, to your faith. I know that you're pious and religious and you're good and you're moral and you really strive to obey God's laws. But Jesus didn't say anything like that to him because Jesus actually knew the real question that was creating the tension in Nick's heart. And so Jesus replied in kind of a funny way, He he said this, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. In fact, would you read that out loud with me? Just read it as loud as you can, all right? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this messed up Nicodemus' whole belief system. I mean, he didn't quite get it completely, all right? Because Nicodemus grew up as a religious young man. He grew up believing, he always believed this, that you get into God's kingdom, that you're made right with God, that you get to spend eternity with God in heaven by the good things you do and by the religious things you do and by being religious and obeying God's law. And what Jesus was basically saying was that's not the case. I mean, Nicodemus believed this, do your best and God will take care of the rest. And Jesus said that just is not what I'm talking about. I mean, this was a crisis for him because of his beliefs. Jesus tossed out all the things that Nicodemus was relying on. In fact, he tossed out all the things that many people today in our culture and our churches are relying on because Nicodemus believed that you just needed to be good. And Jesus didn't say, don't be good. Being good is a good thing. But he said, all your works, all the good things that you do don't matter, Nicodemus. The best you've got doesn't mean squat. You need to be born again to enter God's kingdom. Now, this puzzled Nicodemus, and he went on and asked a question that would be pretty typical when someone says, look, you've got to be born again. That was a new statement he had not heard before. And so Nicodemus says to Jesus, what do you mean? What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? But Jesus wasn't talking about physical birth. He was talking about spiritual birth. He knew that that was impossible. Nicodemus knew that was impossible. And what he did is this. He said that it's spiritual birth. It's not physical birth. And I think like Nicodemus, many of us fail in this area or we tend to see things from a physical perspective. We miss out on God's truth because we see things only from a physical perspective instead of a spiritual perspective. And we fail to factor in God's spirit, his truth, and his power. And Jesus He went back, said the same thing, basically again in another way. Jesus said this. 
He said, unbelievable. No, I'm kidding. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to what? Spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, and just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how some people are born of the Spirit, okay? And Nicodemus understood these terms about the wind, and he also understood about water and the Spirit and those terms that Jesus used because many times water and Spirit represented renewal and cleansing in the Old Testament, and he knew that you can see the effects of the wind. I mean, you know, you can see that. I spent time last week in West Texas. The wind was blowing 40 and 50 miles an hour. Farmers had plowed their fields. The dust was awful. You couldn't see more than like 100 feet in front of you sometimes. It was terrible. You opened your mouth and got grit all in your teeth. You know what I mean? It's just crazy. So you can see the effects of the wind. You don't know where it started. You don't know where it's going to end. And the same is true the work of the Holy Spirit. It's what Jesus was saying. You can't always see where it started. You can't always see where it ends. But he did say this, that the effects of spiritual life will be evident in a person who has truly been born again. Now Nick has more tension because once again, Jesus has pretty well obliterated his belief system and how you get made right with God, how you get into God's kingdom because all of his life, what he believed was Getting into God's kingdom, being made right with God was about what he did. But Jesus says that being born again starts and ends with God. It starts and ends with God. And that there's nothing that you can do to earn it. It is only impossible, excuse me, it's only possible through God's incredible grace, his his indescribable grace. It is unbelievable. In fact, I want you to get this. This is our key phrase for today. God's unbelievable grace is experienced through faith in Jesus. Would you say that with me? God's unbelievable grace is experienced through faith in Jesus. That is the only way we experience the unbelievable grace of Jesus. God. Now, I want you to think about that phrase for just a minute, okay? That phrase, born again. It's talking about birth, right? And birth by nature is is a passive event, isn't it, right? Would you moms agree with that, that birth is passive? You're going, no way. You're crazy. It isn't passive, right? Yeah, it's it's not passive for you. I mean, it's, it's not. It may be passive for the one being born, but it is not passive for mom, okay? And I'm going to ask you, like I asked the other service, any of you go through natural childbirth? Anybody go through? Yeah, I see some hands. Was it passive for you? Yeah, you're laughing, right? I mean, when we had our first two kids, Jeremy and Julie, we, we went that route, natural childbirth. So Janet and I went to the classes. We learned Lamaze. I don't know what you learned now, but that's what we learned, you know, the breathing techniques and all that. But when she was in labor and told to push, you know what? It was not passive. For, it didn't matter what we learned. It wasn't passive for her, and it wasn't passive for me. I had no idea how much strength she had. She almost squeezed my fingers off of my hand. And it was unbelievable because I didn't know it was possible for her to love me and hate me at the same time. (laughs) And that's what happened when she gave birth. And when when our kids were born, I didn't give them some little baby high five and go, way to go, you did so good. Wow, man, I can't believe what you did. I looked at my wife and said, sweetheart, wow. What you did was incredible but they contributed nothing to being born, right? Did any of you contribute anything to your birth? Did you set the date? Did you set the time? And was it all about you? No, but moms pay an incredible price for our birth. And what Jesus says, it staggers Nicodemus and it's significant for all of us because basically what he's saying is this, it doesn't matter how good you are, how moral you are, how religious you are, or how many times you've been baptized, or how many churches you've been a part of, or how much you give, or whatever you do in the community, or you know whatever it is that you, all these good things that you do, we contribute nothing to spiritual birth. Instead, we have a spiritual parent who does all of the work, and he's done all of the work. Being born again is totally dependent upon God the Father doing all the work necessary to make spiritual birth possible. And it's only possible through faith in and believing in 
Jesus Christ. Now, we talk about this quite often here at Grace. You've heard Pastor Chris mention Paul a number of different times. You know, he was a guy that hated, he was a first century historical figure. He hated Christians. He persecuted them. Then he became one because he had this personal encounter with Jesus after Jesus had been raised from the dead. And he became a dynamic follower of Jesus, and he wrote much of what's been preserved for us in the New Testament. And he wrote to the church at Ephesus, and he was trying to explain this whole thing about grace and faith and how we're saved, you know, and and all that. And this is what he said in Ephesians 2. He said, God's grace has saved you because of your faith in what? Christ, not in anything else, not in the church, not in baptism, not in being good, not in being, your faith has saved you. Grace has saved you because of your faith in Christ. In fact, your salvation doesn't come from anything you do. It is God's gift. It is God's gift of love. It is God's gift of grace. It is God's gift to you. It is not based on anything that you have done or ever will do. And and here is the deal. He says that you are saved by God's grace through faith. And you think, well, saved, saved from what? Saved from an eternity separated from God in this life now and in the life to come which will be a literal hell for those that are separated from God. But God doesn't desire that. In fact, God has been chasing after you. And like we sang a while ago, his reckless life, I mean, he, with total abandon, he is chasing after us. And he doesn't want us to be separated from him. He wants a relationship with us that lasts forever. And he made it possible through what Jesus did on the cross. In fact, in Isaiah, Isaiah 30, I think it's verse 18, he says that God, God longs for us. He longs for us to experience his grace and to be gracious to us. And whenever we believe in and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we experience his unbelievable grace. And here's what happens when you experience that. He gives you a pardon and forgiveness for all your sin, all of it. Every sin you'll ever commit, it's, it's pardoned, it's forgiven. And not only that, what happens is he becomes and he comes into a relationship with you as your heavenly father, and it's an eternal relationship that will never end. It starts right now as soon as you trust Jesus, and he's with you from then on throughout eternity. And in addition to that, you get the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit in your life now to help you navigate the difficult waters that we have to navigate in this life. And to add to that, we get hope and peace and love and joy and the promise of eternal life. And in their conversation, in that Nick at night conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus said something that is absolutely extraordinary about the unbelievable grace of God. He said it in one simple sentence that's probably been heard around the world. You've probably heard it, or if you've not, it may be new to you, but it is an explanation of this grace. It's found in John 3, verse 16. If you know it, just say it out loud with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When you look at that verse, and maybe you've seen it many, many times or heard it, or maybe it's your first time, but what jumps out for you? What grabs your attention? If you already have had a relationship with Jesus or you have that, I mean, what does it make you think of when you go back there? And when I look at that verse and think about it, the word that jumps out for me is the word whoever, whoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, believes in Jesus, would not perish but have everlasting life. You know why that word jumps out to me? Because it includes me and it includes you. That no matter who we are and no matter what we've done, God's unbelievable grace can be available to us through faith in Jesus. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your social status is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter what your lifestyle choices have been. It doesn't matter how religious or irreligious you are. It doesn't matter whether you've been good or bad. His grace is available to you through faith in Jesus. When I was a kid, my parents took me to church. You know, they kind of went to church when they were younger. They took me to church, and it was a good thing. And I learned a lot of things about Jesus. I knew who he was. I knew that he died on the cross, that he was raised from. I I knew all that stuff, okay? But when I became a teenager, I didn't care. And I didn't, I I, I just rebelled against all. I was wild and rebellious. I ran from God, didn't want to have anything to do with God or the church. But when I was 19, I ran head on into the unbelievable grace of God. 
And it took me by surprise, but I understood it for the first time. And I made a decision to trust and follow Jesus, to believe in him and receive him. And it was the greatest decision I have ever made in my life. And you want to know why it was so great? Because now I no longer knew things about him, but I knew him personally. He was with me. He promised to never leave me. You know, what's interesting to me is that a month later, my mother, who had taught Sunday school and been in the church all of her life, was saved. She was saved in a church service just like this. And when I was talking to her about it, she looked at me, and she calls me Bill. You can call me whatever. But anyhow, she said, Bill, the thing that was missing all these years was Jesus. You see, it didn't matter how much religious stuff she had done or how much she had tried. The issue was Jesus was missing, and now she had put her faith and trust in Jesus. She didn't just know about him. She knew him. And there were people in the, in the New Testament times, there were members of Jesus' family. Did you know that Jesus had half-brothers and some half-sisters? And, and the New Testament tells us, if you read it carefully, his half-brothers and sisters, they, they believed that he'd gone crazy. He lost his mind over the things he was doing and saying. They did not believe in him. One of them was a guy named James, his half-brother. And he was a part of the people that thought Jesus lost his mind. But James was there when Jesus was crucified he saw him buried, and then he saw him after he was raised from the dead. And then James called him, my Lord. I am the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. James believed in and received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And this guy, James, became a leader of the first church in Jerusalem. And he wrote a letter that's been preserved for us in the New Testament. And part of that letter in James 2.19, he wrote these words that I think are incredible. You believe that there is one God. Well, that's good. It's good that you believe in God or believe there's a God, but even the demons believe that and they shake with fear. And what he was saying was simply this. It's okay for you to believe that there's a God. I mean, that's a good thing, but you need to understand that demons believe that and there are no demons that have hope or joy or peace and they won't be in heaven. They won't spend eternity with the Father. And what he was saying here was simply this. Listen, to believe in Jesus, to be born again, means more than just knowing about him. It means that you know him and that you go all in with him. And it's the greatest decision that you can ever make because once again, we experience this through faith. In fact, here's our key phrase that we're talking about. God's unbelievable grace is experienced through faith in Jesus. In fact, God made it so simple that a child can understand. And sometimes we try to make it difficult. I want to I share with you with a simple illustration that some of you maybe have seen before. Maybe you haven't. If you have, maybe it'll help you explain it to someone else. But I have something up here on the stage with me. What is this? Out loud, this is response time. What is this? A stool. What color is it? Black and brown. Yeah, it's got a brown top. It looks like some kind of wood or fake wood or something on it. Anyhow, now, what is the purpose of this stool? To sit on. Yeah, it's, it's made to hold us up, Right. And this is a question that's going to sound a little weird, but I'm going to ask you this. Do you believe in this stool? Yeah. You believe it'll accomplish its purpose for you, right? And I do too. But it cannot accomplish its purpose for me until I put the full weight of my trust in it, until I go all in. And that's when it's able to do for me what it was created to do. Now, here's what I believe I've seen in the church and in our communities. We have a lot of people like my mom and like, you know, other people and like myself, if you think of this stool representing kind of Jesus, that knew things about him. There are a lot of people that know facts about Jesus. They kind of know who he is. Some don't, but most do. And so maybe, maybe they even understand his purpose, why he came. If you asked me before I was 19, why did Jesus come? I said, well, he died on the cross for our sins. I mean, I knew that. And most people believe in him, Right? They believe that he exists or they believe in God. I know there's a lot of people that don't, but a lot of people believe in him. But here's the issue with that. See, they've not taken that next step of going all in in their faith in him to trust him. And what a lot of people want to do, we like to get close to him, you know. How do we get, oh, we're going to go to church once in a while and that makes us feel good. It makes us feel good about we're kind of good people and we're kind of religious and surely God's going to let us into heaven because of that. I mean, we like to get up close. We know some of the lingo. Maybe we give a little money in the offering basket once in a while. We even say grace over a meal once in a while. And we kind of like to come and lean into this. But the truth is, is that we've never put, in the, put the full force of our trust in him. We've never gone all in in our faith in Jesus. And to receive what he offers you, which is to be born again and receive the gift of eternal life. 
means you gotta go all in and trust him. And that's what I'm asking you to do today. Would you go all in with Jesus, all in in your faith with him and trust him completely and totally with your life? So I wanna ask you to bow your heads for just a minute. And if that's something you want, we could tell him together. Be the greatest decision that you ever make. And and I I just want us to pray together. And prayer is just the way of marking your decision. There's no magical words that we say. But if you'd say today, man, that's what I need. I don't want to know about Jesus. I want to know him personally. Would you just pray something like this if you want to commit your life to him? Just say, Lord, I know that I have messed up and sinned. And I know I need your forgiveness. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. To pay the penalty and the debt for my sin. I also believe you were raised from the dead. which proves that your claims were true. That you are Lord, God, and the Messiah. Today, I want to go all in with you. I put my faith and trust in you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart and life as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for loving me and saving me. Please help me now become the person you intended me to be. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Listen. If you made that decision, yeah, I don't care how long you've been in church. Just like my mom, when she made her, man, we celebrated that. It was something to be excited about. And if you if you made that decision, we're so excited for you. You've taken your first step in this journey with Jesus, in this relationship with Jesus. It's the first step in your spiritual journey. And your next step needs to be that you share it with someone. Tell someone about what you've done so they can pray with you. One of the best things you could do today would be to either let us know using the QR code, whether you're here or watching online, you can go to the QR code and let us know that you made that decision today. Or even better than that, if you're here, there'll be some prayer partners at the front after the service. Just come and tell them, hey, I, I, I prayed that prayer with Pastor BJ. I invited Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And they'll pray with you. And, and we just want to help you in this journey. And your next step needs to be baptized. That's the public way that you share with people that you've chosen to trust and follow Jesus. And we have baptism every month here at Grace. In fact, it's next Sunday. So you could go ahead and get in on the action and be baptized. It would be so incredible if you'd do that. You can find out more about that, again, using the QR code. And I know that some of you, maybe some of you watching online and some of you here, you're not sure about all this stuff still. You're not sure if you believe this guy up here talking. You still got questions. Listen, I want to say this to you. We're so glad that you do. We're glad that you're here. This is a safe place. This is a place where you can come and belong before you believe and you can ask your questions. We'd love to get to know you. We'd love to be able to sit down with you and try to answer those questions because the thing that we desire more for you than anything else is that you would experience the unbelievable grace of God through Jesus as many of us have. Some of you, you've been a Christian for a long time or maybe just a short time. But you came in here today and you already knew that you would put your faith and trust in Jesus. And I just want to say this to you, kind of as we wrap this up, that genuine faith in Jesus implies something, that your lifestyle and your actions will be different because you've been born again. In fact, John, who wrote the Gospel of John, John chapter 3, also wrote this uh, in 1 John. He said, those who say they live in God, in other words, who say that God lives in them and they live in God, that you've been, whatever you call it, you're a believer, you're a follower of Jesus, you've been saved, you're a Christian. If you claim that, you should live your life or they should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, granted, we know that none of us are going to live a life of perfection like Jesus did. 
But the direction of our life should change. When I made a decision to trust Jesus at 19, the direction of my life changed. Now, I had some habits. It took a while to break some of those, some things that I struggled with. But the direction of my life changed, and your life will change as you yield to Jesus on a daily basis. Again, God's unbelievable grace is experienced through faith in Jesus. And it's your faith in Jesus that saves you. It's also faith in Jesus on a daily basis where you experience his grace. Listen, his grace doesn't just save you. His grace sustains you. His grace transforms you. It empowers you. It blesses you. It grows you. It heals you. It transforms you as you learn to trust Jesus every day. And for some of you, maybe what needs to happen with you today is you need to take a good look at your life and realize you hadn't really been living for Jesus as you should. When you think about what he did in his grace, and so maybe what you just simply need to do is just pray and confess that sin and say, Lord, I, I really want to get back on the right track. I want to serve you. I want to be what you want to be. In fact, it's really easy. Let me give you two real simple things you can do to start serving him. And Pastor Chris has already talked about them, Right? Two simple things you could do. The first one you could do would be simply think about someone you know in your life, a coworker, a family member, somebody in your community that's far from God, or maybe you, you know that they're struggling with this whole concept of God, for you to be in praying for them right now. And then invite them to come to a service. There are six. Point them out. Say, which one are you coming to? I'll come and I'll be with you. I want to sit with you. And then the second way that's so simple that you can begin doing something significant where you serve Jesus is to do what Pastor Chris said, attend a service and then serve a service. In fact, like he said, serve five services because we need you because Easter's gonna be incredible here at Grace. You know what's gonna happen if you do that? When you come to it, you're gonna be a part of someone that's here on Easter weekend who for the first time in their life, they're gonna experience the unbelievable, unfathomable, extraordinary amazing grace of God through Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for the privilege today of just talking about your unbelievable grace. Thank you that you pour out grace upon grace upon grace on us, that your mercies are new every day. God, I pray for every person in this room, whatever the next step is we need to take with you, that we'd have the courage to do it. For some that are watching online, some of them here that may still have questions, that they would have the courage to ask those questions that we would walk in your grace every day by faith. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Aren't you grateful for God's grace? It's, aren't you grateful for God's grace? It's because of his grace that we can find joy and happiness and peace. So we're going to stand before we leave and we're going to sing one more time. Sing about that joy that God has given us through his grace. Here we go. Song of Thanksgiving is my 
Bless you. See you next time.